We want to change the way that people think about student finance. It has been full of myths and misunderstandings because of the political spittle. Your future has been used as a political football by our politicians trying to score points against each other in debate. And the thing they have forgotten, and the thing that's most important for us to focus on today, is what is the practical impact on your pocket of going to university? How is it going to affect your life? How are you going to pay it back? How are you going to afford to live while you are at university? And that's what I want to talk about. So I'm going to start ask you some questions. I'm going to see how we do on this. First of all, how much typically does it cost to go to university in England? And we're talking today about in the English student finance system that started in 2012. So how much does it cost to go, anyone? Yeah, how? Uh, £9,000 a year. £9,000 a year, anyone else? Not quite? Yeah? 9,250. 9,250 is the cost of tuition fees. How much to go to university on a three-year course? 27,000 or 27,750 if you want to do. No. Um, yeah. 50K. Oh, fascinating that you say that. Wrong. Um, <laughs> anyone else? Would you like to know the answer? Yeah. How much it's going to cost you? I don't know. <laughs> this is really important. When people talk about the cost of university, and your 50,000 figure is sort of getting in the ballpark that people talk about. You could argue it's 60,000 now. It's got 9,250 a year times three is 27,750. There's also a living loan that we're going to talk about later. In other words, how do you afford to live when you're there? If you've got the maximum London living loan, living away from home, plus 9,250 on a three-year course, you're talking nearly 60,000 pounds. A lot of money? But here's the point. That number, for the vast majority of you, is completely meaningless. The weird thing in student finance is the price tag, the amount they say it costs, 60,000 pounds, is completely delinked from what you'll actually pay. And what really counts is what you'll actually pay. And I can tell you that the actual cost of you going to university will be somewhere between nothing and about 150 grand. And what does it depend on? Does anyone know? What's the key factor? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> how much you're earning? How much you earn when you leave university. This is all about that. Do you know how much you repay? Um, I think it's uh, if you're earning like 20 something thousand after that. You repay 9% of everything you earn over currently £25,725 a year. 9% of everything you earn over £25,700-ish, 25, and that figure will go up each year. So let's do a simple sum. Who's good at maths in here? We've got some volunteers. Well, okay, we do here. Here you go, you're ready. So if you earned £26,725 a year, how much above the £25,725 a year threshold is that? A thousand. A thousand. Nine percent of a thousand is? Ninety. Ninety. So if you earn twenty-six thousand seven hundred and twenty-five pounds a year, you're repaying ninety pounds a year. Someone else? Another volunteer? Yes. Right. If you earn thirty-five thousand seven hundred and twenty-five pounds a year, how much above twenty-five thousand seven hundred and twenty-five pounds a year is that? Uh, ten thousand. Ten thousand. Nine percent of ten thousand is? Nine hundred pounds. Nine hundred pounds. So at 26,700 odd quid, it's 90 pounds a year. At 35,700 odd quid, it's 900 pounds a year. If you earned 125,725 pounds, it'd be 9,000 pounds a year. What you repay is in direct proportion to what you earn. If you earn 24,000 pounds a year, how much do you repay? Nothing. Nothing. So you're starting to hear the language of how this really works. Everybody, for, it's a debt. It's a debt! It's a debt! 60,000 pounds, how is my life going to work? What are my children going to do? It's what you hear when I do phone-ins. Parents, how are my kids ever going to repay this 60,000 pound debt? 
well, hold on, they're repaying 9% of everything they earn above £25,725 a year. If you're worried they're going to be low earners, that's your least worry. I'm out of breath now, I'm old. <laughs> that's your least worry. If they're going to be low earners, how much do they repay? Nothing. They repay nothing. Anyone know when the debt wipes? In fact, it's 30 years after the April following when you leave university. So if you go at age of 18, you've got three years at university, let's say the following April, you're now 21-ish, so the debt will be wiped when you're 51. And you repay 9% of everything you earn above a threshold, and I need to say it's a threshold because that figure changes each year, hopefully will go up each year with average earnings. That's what they've said. We'll talk about whether that'll stick later on. So that's the core concept. £60,000 is the price tag, but the cost to you is what you repay each year. If, and I hope it doesn't happen, you were never to get a job above the threshold in that 30 years, you would not repay a penny for your education. Who pays the most? Who will repay the most for their education? The people that earn the most. The people that earn the most. Technically not quite true. There's actually a bizarre curve here that says low earners pay nothing, mid-low earners start to pay something, mid earners pay more, high earners pay more, very high earners pay more, extremely high earners start to pay less. And I'll explain why later. But yeah, in general, the more you earn, the more you repay. So my hope for you is that university is going to cost you a fortune because it means you're a high earner. This is a financially no win, no fee system. If you don't gain financially from your education, then hopefully you won't repay a lot for it and it won't be prohibitive. If you're on £26,000 a year, £26,700 a year, you're repaying £90 a year from your pay packet. So that's the crucial thing, that difference between the cost of university and the price tag. But there's a few more things. Who pays for you to go to university? Who pays the tuition fees? Do you know? The government, sort of, the student loans company. You do not have to pay up front to go to university. But it's really important to make sure, especially those of you whose parents never went to university, understand. When you go to university as a first-time UK undergraduate, your tuition fees are paid automatically for you. You have to apply for it, but they're paid automatically for you by the student loans company. That 9,250 figure that we talked about earlier. That gets paid for you. That goes to them. You don't think about it. You don't actually need to think about it until the April after you start graduate when you're going to have, be eligible to start repaying if you earn enough. So there's no upfront charge. But there is actually something that's far more difficult for most students. And that's who's going to pay for you to live while at university. Who is it? Do you know? This is what you've got to think out. I mean, at the moment, I would suggest most of you, probably not all of you, but most of you live at home with your parents. The things that you have are generally paid for by in the family home, by your parents, in the way it works. When you go to university, who pays? Look at that face there. <coughs> Don't think on me, I haven't got a clue. Yes? Um, you can normally get a maintenance loan, and then that's normally, if you get the full London amount, around 9,000 a year, you get it termly. Spot on. Maintenance loan. So we're still in the loan system. When you go to university, your living costs come from a maintenance loan, or at least that's what you're supposed to think. In many ways, while all the political focus is on the tuition fees, this is the thing you're going to have the most practical difficulty with. Living while at university. Is the loan enough? How does it actually work? And there's a conversation I'm going to want you to have with your parents here, which is crucially important. And for those of you watching at home, if you're sitting watching with your parents, keep watching. Don't look awkwardly at each other while we go through this. You can have the conversation afterwards, but this is very important that you're going to do it. So here's how it works. The maintenance loan that you get, first of all, depends on three factors. Are you living at home? If you're not living at home, are you studying in London or out of London? The lowest loan, full loan is for those living at home. 
then for those living away from home outside London, and the biggest loan is for those living away from home in London. For obvious reasons, London is a more expensive city to live in than the rest of the country. But here's what is not talked about. Here, in fact, is what I believe the government hides from you, hides from your parents. The amount of maintenance loan that you will get, the amount of loan that you get to live off, is means tested. In other words, it depends on what's called your family's residual income. Forget the residual word, it just overcomplicates it and means they take off some pension contributions your parents make. So family income means parental income. That's the point I'm making. Family income means parental income. How much you get to live off at university depends on how much your parents earn. Now this is really important because when you go to university you're going to be 18. You're going to be old enough to get married. You're going to be old enough to vote. You're going to be old enough to join the army and die for our country. But under the student finance system, you are not old enough to be counted as an independent adult. Your finances will still depend, even though you've all been sitting there 18, I'm independent, do what I like. <laughs> not in the student finance system. What you get depends on your parents. And this makes a big impact. Up to half, they can reduce the loan by up to half because of your parental income. So if your parents earn roughly over £65,000 combined, roughly, then you'll get half the loan that those people whose parents earn less than £25,000 get. But here's the fun bit that I really, really like. <laughs> so let's think about it. The living away from home outside of London maintenance loan currently is around £9,000 a year if you got the full amount, roughly £9,000 a year. So if your parents earn over £65,000, you're going to get £4,500. Who does the government say should make up the difference? Parents. Anyone else? No. No. No, they, they don't say anything at all. <laughs> they don't even tell you that your loan has been reduced. What's going to happen is you're going to get a letter. And your letter is going to be like this. What's your name? Zoe. Dear Zoe. <laughs> How are you? They won't be like that. Dear Zoe, we would like to inform you that your maintenance loan in the first year is going to be £4,500. That's it. That's what you get. It doesn't say, dear Zoe, the full loan somebody in your circumstance would be getting is £9,000. But due to the means testing of family residual income, you'll only be getting £4,500 which I'd prefer. It doesn't say what I would really like it to say, which is, dear Zoe, the full loan for somebody in your circumstance is £9,000. You're getting £4,500. The gap is £4,500. We're expecting your parents to make up that gap, which you could then take to your parents and say, look, here is the expected parental contribution. It doesn't say that. What it does is it sets you against your parents. Because you go to university, this conversation hasn't been had, you get four and a half thousand pounds, your cost of living at that university is seven thousand pounds a year for rent, your parents are saying, and I have had this on my TV roadshows, I had a guy who came up to me who was living on cold baked beans and saying, I can't afford to live at university, my loan isn't big enough, and I looked at it and said, what about the parental contribution? And he said, well my parents have said, you're on your own now. You know, university is about being an independent adult. Go for it. You've got to do this yourself. Because nobody had told them about the parental contribution. This is hidden within the system. If you get less than the full loan, by definition, it is based on family income, then the state is expecting your parents to contribute. It's not me doing that. I don't necessarily think it's right. But that is how the system works. Now, your parents may not be able to afford to contribute. I accept that. But what is really important is you do this. If you remember nothing else today, remember this. When you get your loan letter, find out what the full loan is. Subtract what you're getting from the full loan. So let's say you're getting 5,000 pounds and the full loan's 9,000 pounds. 9,000 minus 5,000 is? 4,000 pounds. 4,000 pounds and you say to your parents, the gap from the full loan 
the parental contribution is £4,000. It would be great if you could help me to that amount. Guess what you can do if your parents don't want to give you the money? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. You've got no way to force your parents to give you money. They're not legally responsible for giving you the money. Unless you're declared what's called an independent adult, which properly means you have to be estranged from your family and not in contact and financially independent. You know, it's not something you can jemmy just to get this to work. Then it doesn't make up the gap. And actually, many of the students who struggle most at university are not those from the poorest families, because they get the full loan. It's those in the middle. The really rich, well, they've got enough money that it can, you know, they're going to give the kids anyway. Those in the middle who've never had this discussion. And the parents get really upset. And when I tell them, and they come and talk to me when I'm doing my road shows, and they come and talk to me, and I say, what about the parental contribution? And they say, I didn't know. Am, am I meant to give that? And now, so when I had a big argument with a guy called Joe Johnson, Boris's brother, who was university's minister about this, and I said, this is absolutely inappropriate. The state, at the very least, if you're going to have an implied parental contribution, the state should tell people what the parental contribution is. He said, no, students can make up the gap any way they choose. They can go out to work, they can get scholarships, they can get grants. And I said, well, then why do you assess them based on their parents' income? Well, it doesn't make sense. If the only factor that dictates how much you're going to get is your parents' income, then the state is saying there is a parental contribution system. So look. You have to be fair with your parents. The, the parental contribution system is really rough. It just takes income into account. If your family earns £70,000 a year and have hideous credit card debts of £50,000 a year, that is not factored in. Did you know about it? No. And let me tell you, your parents don't know about it either in most cases. So really important. So we've done what you pay to go to university. The state pays. We've done how much you live off the maintenance loan. I have to tell you, even the full loan is going to be a struggle. When I went to university, which is five or six years ago now, <laughs> that was too loud. It wasn't that funny. <laughs> Out. Can I do that? To when I went to university, it was actually, which was uh, 1991, way before any of you were born. So when I went to university, we were at the cusp of a changeover. Before that, it was actually rather frowned upon to work while you were at uni. You know, the thought was you should be here focused on your studies. You shouldn't be out going getting a part-time job at the time. And I was at the point where that was changing somewhat because to be able to afford to go, you know, you often needed to work. When you go, there is a good thing that the landscape has changed totally. As an employer, I can tell you this. I want you to go to university and get a really good degree. But I'd also like to see some real life experience. And working is really important. And people can get snobbish about this. They think that working means you have to go and get some brilliant, amazing job right in the summer holidays, and it was just incredible. We just tripped off. <laughs> you know, no, I was working at this, uh, I was working at this record company doing RNA. It was amazing. <laughs> Look, actually, I don't want to see that. As an employer, a work ethic will do. You know, if you stack the shelves in a supermarket overnight while you were a student, I know that means you've got some real oomph and graft and determination about you to enable yourself to succeed and thrive when you move on. So you are probably, to be able to afford to live, going to want to get yourself a job whilst you're at university, a part-time job, a weekend job, a job in your summer holidays. Go and do it. It'll be great if it can give you work experience in whatever profession you might want to go on afterwards, but it doesn't have to be. So Thankfully, your generation, universities don't look negatively on the fact that you're going to go and get work. And I, as an employer, would encourage you to do so. And don't get too granular about, is it a good job for my CV or isn't it? What I actually want to see is, this person can graft. Yeah, they've got a degree in a relevant subject for what I'm employing them. But look, also, they've gone out and they've done some hard work at the same time. And it's really valuable that you go and do so. So we have tuition fees sorted. We have maintenance loans, which may not be big enough, and there's a parental contribution, and you may have to work at the same time, and also check out grants and scholarship websites. How do you repay the maintenance loan? I thought you were here to tell us. Why keep asking us questions? Um, anyone? It's exactly the same as the tuition fee loan. They're all added together. You have one loan in effect. So we have the £9,250 a year, and then we have the up to £11,000 a year of living costs on top. You lump them together over three years. You leave university. You will have a loan on your account of somewhere between, you know, 
£30,000 and £60,000, that will be the nominal amount. And you will then repay that 9% of everything you earn above £25,725 for 30 years unless you earn enough to clear the debt first. And this is the really important bit. How many people do you think clear what they borrowed plus interest, which we'll discuss a little bit later, in the 30 years before the debt wipes? 10%? Anyone else? 5%. It's actually a little bit more. 17% is predicted. So 83% of people will not clear the borrowing figure plus interest in the 30 year before it wipes. So what's that? There's about 100 of you in the room. So who am I going to pick? We'll pick. These lot are your high achievers, <laughs> right? Or actually high earners. So you're all going to be the high earners up to probably about here. So you lot are all going to repay in full. So what I say to you is totally different than what I'm going to say to all of this. I'm sure, look at her face. Why am I at the bottom? <laughs> that was it. I was. I'm going to be one of them over there, you know. Do you want to swap places? No. Right. So that's really important. Just visualize that. The vast majority of those of you who go to university, assuming you all do, and you can make your decision after this because you'll actually understand the choice that you're making, are not going to clear the debt in full in the 30 years. Now, this is really important because let's go back to £60,000. £60,000, my children. Right. Let's go back to that. For 83% of you, in effect, the amount that you borrow, the debt that you'll currently see on your statement that says £60,000 plus interest being added each year is pretty much irrelevant for all of you. Because what you pay depends on what you earn. And you're going to pay it for 30 years. You're going to pay that 9% for 30 years. Can I have two volunteers? This is going to be relatively simple. Don't be scared. Yes. So if you come out and you come out, if you both come out, Right, don't be scared, don't, I promise it'll be nice. So, so you come either way. What's your name? Ayo. Ayo. So you stand there, and your name? Carice. Carice. You're my graduate. You're going to university, and you're going to have your student loan, you're going to do all of that. Ayo? No. Ayo, no go. <laughs> um, wasn't good, but it was quick, and that'll do. So, right, so you're not going to university. This is the practical impact, you two are props, just look pretty, it's good. <laughs> this is the practical impact of going to university for most of you. Do you know how tax works? No. Okay, so let's start basically. All of us are allowed to earn currently this year, and these thresholds change each year, 12 and a half thousand pounds a year before income tax is taken out of us. So you've earned up to 12 and a half grand, you're not taxed. If any of you have got part-time jobs now, I doubt you earn over £12,500 a year, so you won't pay any tax on it. If you did, you'd start to pay tax. £12,500 a year, you pay 20% tax of everything you earn above £12,500. That first £12,500, you still don't pay tax on. Above £12,500, you're going to pay tax on it. It's called marginal taxation. At £50,000, the tax rate goes up to 40%. So everything you earn above £50,000, 40% disappears. You keep 60, the state takes 40 but on the amounts below, you're still paying 20% on the gap in between and nothing here. It's really important. People say to me, I still get, you know, pe working people who've worked for years who say, I'm about to get a pay rise and it's going to make me a higher rate taxpayer. That's the 40% band. Should I say no? Because they think the 40% is going to apply to all their earnings. It only applies to the bit above 50 grand. So earning more pays more. And if you're lucky enough to earn over 150,000 pounds, the income tax rate is 45%. But... It's different for graduates in practical terms because graduates repay 9% of everything they earn above £25,725. And they repay it just like tax through the payroll if you're employed, so it comes off before you get it. So let's do it. Non-graduate, graduate. Okay. From zero to £12,500, how much tax will you be effectively paying? Nothing. From zero to £12,500, how much tax will you effectively be paying? Nothing. 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 <laughs> It's the same, yeah. From 12,500, listen to the crucial figure, to 25,725 pounds, 
Do you remember how much will you be paying? 20. 20%. How much will you be paying? 20. 20%. Right? Same amount. From £25,725, which is the student finance repayment threshold that only graduates repay above that, not giving any clues. How much will you pay? The tax threshold hasn't changed. It's the same as it was before. 20. <laughs> he got it. You're with it, aren't you? You're still paying 20%. You haven't been to university. There's no change for you. You're still based on the income tax threshold. But you have gone to university. So you've got your 20% to pay, but there's also the 9%. There's 20 and there's 9%. There's 20 and there's 9%. How much are you going to pay? 29%. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Starting to see this. Now, at £50,000, the tax threshold goes up to 40%. So how much will you as a non-graduate will pay? 40%. But you've also got the student finance 9%. How much will you repay? 49%. 49%. Above £150,000, where the rate goes up to 45%, how much will you pay? 45%. And how much will you repay? 54%. 54%. So, the real difference to going to university and the way you should actually think about it, for 83% of you, is not this is a debt, how am I going to repay it? But is in fact, you, above £25,725, will be repaying 9% more effective tax than our non-graduate here. And that's the way to think about it. Give these two a round of applause. <laughs> and this is a really important fact. Now, I need to be plain. Don't think I'm saying that that's cheap. That isn't cheap. This isn't about saying it's not a big deal, don't think about it, don't worry about it. It's a, it can be a lot of money, but it's not a debt hanging over you. It's not a debt noose around your net, 60,000 pounds, 60,000 pounds, how am I gonna pay 60,000 pounds? You don't, you're repaying that 9%. You are going to pay more tax than the equivalent. Now you have to ask yourself the question, is it worth it? Am I gonna gain enough from my university education that it is worth paying 9% more tax. If you go to university and you earn the same amount as you would have done had you not gone to university, you are going to have less money in your pocket because of it. If you go to university and you earn more than you would have done had you not gone to university, then depending on the exact equation, you will have more money in your pocket even though you're paying more tax. And that is the financial debate. I should say, though, it's not really what I talk about, but university is about way more than how much you're going to earn. Going to university will let you meet people you wouldn't otherwise have met, let you engage in activities that you wouldn't have the option for, develop yourself as a human being to understand how our society works, what's going on about there, time to think, time to engage, time to grow, time to get a different set of values from the more narrow ones that we were all brought up in. That's not you, that's all of us. So university is far more than just about how much you're going to earn afterwards. Now, I actually have campaigned that we don't call this a student loan. In practical terms, not political, but in practical terms, it's more like extra tax, which is why I argue it should be called a graduate contribution scheme. Because it's not students who pay it, it's graduates. It's university leavers. And if I'd come in here and said, imagine we did the speech again. <laughs> so I'm here to talk to you about your graduate contribution scheme. As you all know, if you go to university and you earn over 25,725 pounds a year, you're gonna repay 9% above that amount until you repay roughly the cost of your going to university and the amount that it costs you to live off. If we talked about it like that, it'd have a very different feel, wouldn't it? And that is the problem. Anyone tell me what the interest on the student loan is? Yes. You're good, you got the first one right. He's... Oh no, okay. go on, go. <laughs> there's a lot of pressure. Uh, does it depend? There is interest on student loans. The interest you pay while you are a student currently is RPI, which is the rate of inflation, plus 3%. That's 2.4% is the rate of inflation, plus 3% is 5.4%. That's 
the amount of interest that is added to your student loan account while you are at university. Once you leave university, the amount of interest that's added to your student loan account, and there's a reason for my convoluted phrasing, which I'll explain in a moment, is if you earn less than £25,725 a year is the rate of inflation, RPI. If you earn more than £46,305 is inflation plus 3%. So below the 25-ish is inflation, above the 46-ish is inflation plus 3%. And if you're in the middle, it's a linear progression. So it goes up in a straight line between the two. So if you're halfway between, it's inflation plus 1.5%. You got those numbers roughly. So that is the amount that we pay. Now, who knows what inflation is? Yeah, go on, tell me what inflation is. Money losing its value. Money losing its value, or the, co the price of things increasing. So yeah, generally, prices increase. Occasionally, we have deflation, but usually we have inflation, which means what you pay for something today, in a year's time, you'll likely pay a little bit more for. A year after, a little bit more on top. And also, what you earn today for doing exactly the same thing in exactly the same circumstance in a year's time, you'll earn a little bit more. A year after that, you'll earn a little bit more. So a salary of £15,000 a year for somebody working now is not a high salary, but back in the 1970s, woohoo! It doesn't actually mean 15000 It doesn't change anything. It's just it's a notional value, if you understand. It doesn't really matter. And equally, a salary of £150,000 a year now, woohoo! But if you earn £150,000 a year when you guys are retiring, it probably won't be that much. Right? It doesn't mean anything. It's just the way money works. So let's imagine it like this. Let's imagine now you had a loan which was linked solely to inflation. So forget the plus 3%. It's linked solely to, the co to inflation. Now, imagine you borrow, for ease of numbers only, £10,000. So your total loan is £10,000. This year, that is enough to buy 100 shopping trolleys worth of supermarket shopping. So £10,000 is 100 shopping trolleys worth of supermarket shopping. Inflation goes up by 2%. So next year, that £100 worth of shopping, it costs £102, and the year after, £104 and a little bit, and the year after, £106 and a little bit more. So it costs £106. If you have to repay your loan in 30 years' time, the £10,000 may have increased to £25,000 with inflation. But equally, if it has, then the shopping trolleys now cost £250 each. They don't cost £100. So you borrowed enough to buy 100 shopping trolleys worth of goods, and you're repaying enough to buy 100 shopping trolleys worth of goods. The net purchasing power effect on your pocket hasn't changed because your salary will have also likely gone up hopefully by more than that, but by two and a half times. So we haven't actually increased your cost. This is what's called in economics, no real cost, because everything's gone up in line. The fact that the number's gone up doesn't matter because your wages have gone up, costs have gone up, everything's gone up in proportion to each other. Do you understand that concept? So if you had a student loan that was set at the rate of inflation, then there's no real cost to you. And in fact, some people have student loans at less than the rate of inflation. Some people went to university earlier. And that means, in real terms, their loan is shrinking, not growing. Now, your loans, or the current system anyway, is set while you're at university 3% more than inflation. So the real cost to you is 3%. Forget the inflation figure. It's 3% is the actual practical impact on your pocket. And after you graduate, or after you leave university, if you don't graduate, you still have to repair a loan, it's somewhere between nothing and 3%. So that's what's added, and this really upsets people because that is very high, and I too appreciate it, it is high. You know, in some cases, RPR, inflation plus 3% is higher than a mortgage rate. But here's the really complicated bit, and here's the, the bit of the brain twist that you're going to have to get your heads around, which is why I've gone through step by step by step. I'll go back to what I said the interest that is added to your student loan statement. What I didn't say is the interest that you pay. Because those two things are not the same. Is anybody, and probably this corner here, the business and economic students, is anyone working out why they're not the same? Yes. 
because you're still only paying the 9%. Boom! <laughs> because what you pay is 9% of everything above £25,725. The only people who will repay all the interest added to their statement is that lot over there. The 17% who will clear in full, because to clear in full you have to clear all the interest. Now, if we imagine, and I'm so sorry for you, I keep doing this to you, that these are the lowest earners who go to university, and we're getting progressively higher as we go around here. So we've got middle earners here, pretty high earners here, uber high earners, high earners here, and these four, dead man and dead woman, right? They are, they are the top notch. We start here. Well, this lot aren't earning enough. You repay nothing, because they're not over the threshold. This is roughly proportioned, this isn't scientific. It's uh, totemic. So you repay nothing. I'm sure you will, but you repay nothing, right? This lot here, during their lifetime, will get just above the threshold. So they won't repay enough to clear what they borrowed, never mind interest. Forget the interest, you're repaying a little bit, but not too much. You might repay four or five thousand pounds or something, but nothing compared to the initial borrowing. You lot here are starting to get, so you're repaying what you borrowed, and maybe a little bit of interest, but nothing like the inflation plus 3% that may have been added, or it won't be because you're not that high earners, or nothing close to inflation. So in real terms, what you're repaying is less than you originally borrowed. In cash terms, it's more. Do you understand the difference? Cash terms is the, the actual price tag, but real terms is the price tag plus inflation. So you're repaying less. You guys, you're actually starting to pay a little bit of interest over and above inflation. Not too much, just a little bit. Here, you're paying quite a bit more than inflation, but you're not paying as much as has been added because you're not clearing in full within the 30 years. And you, you're repaying everything. So this is all the point that it goes back to. In practical terms, yes, interest is added. In practical terms, for probably half of you, the fact interest is added, or maybe a bit more than half of you, means you will pay more than if interest wasn't added. So it's no difference to you lot, it's more difference to you lot. But in reality, you repay 9% of everything you earn above £25,725. You'll do that for 30 years, unless you're a really high earner. So yes, politically we can argue, should it or shouldn't it be added, but in practical terms, for all but you guys, it's just 9% added tax. Now, you will have parents will be very concerned about that rate of interest. They will be really concerned about it because what you'll also see, and this is something, again, I campaign against, is when you leave university, you're going to get a statement and it's going to say you've borrowed £50,000 and it's going to add each month the interest on top and it's going to be five, six, seven hundred pounds being added on top, right, in some cases. And it's going to look horrendous and you're going to go, oh, the interest, it's awful. And I know people who have got so panicked about the interest they see on their statement adding up, and up, and up, and up, and up, that they come into some money from an inheritance or they get some savings and they think, well, the best thing I can do to reduce the interest is to pay some of my student loan off. But some of the people who tell me they've done that have even been earning less than £25,000 a year. Can you see the problem? You've got a £50,000 loan. You repay £10,000 of you off. We'll forget inflation for the moment. So you now owe £40,000. You're earning £25,000 a year, less than the threshold. How much has it actually saved you repaying by clearing ten grand off the debt? Nothing. Nothing. You flush £10,000 down the toilet. That's real. And then they say to me, can I get the money back? If you've overpaid the student loan system in error, you can get the money back. If you voluntarily overpaid it, which is what this lady had, you cannot get the money back. Which is why you all need to know how it works way before you even take the loan out, never mind once you start repaying it. And it gets more complex, even if she had been earning above the threshold. 
The actual maths is she would have had to be earning enough to clear 40,000 debt plus inflation over the 30 years before paying the 10,000 pounds off would have saved her any money at all, which is actually probably this sort of line in my nice 100 people in a room proportion. So everybody here shouldn't pay 10 grand off, off a 50,000 pound loan. Everybody here, it may have benefited you. It probably benefited you a lot the most. Now, if she'd had enough money to clear the loan, well then in, in real terms, it's everyone who repays the loan plus inflation. So it's probably here. Everybody here would have gained, but everybody here wouldn't have gained. So it's a very complex equation. So someone answered me the question, when parents say to me, we've got savings, or should I take out a loan so my child doesn't have to have a student loan, what's the answer? No. Or, slightly more technically, only if you're absolutely sure your child is going to be a very high earner and going to work consistently for 30 years afterwards, because if they don't work consistently for 30 years, they won't have to repay so much, then you may want to, if you've got that much spare cash and you've already saved up for a mortgage deposit for them, because I'd say that's a much bigger and more difficult thing you're all going to face than repaying the student loan, would I consider overpaying their student loan for them. And by the way, are you absolutely sure when they start university that you know what profession they're going to take? I know they're studying to be a lawyer or a doctor, but they may change their mind, would be my answer. But your no was a bit simpler. Um, probably just as right. But the fact that you all just went no is music to my ears, because it means we're starting to change the way that we think about this system. Do you think you would have said no at the beginning? You'd have probably said pay it off, wouldn't you? because you get less debt. Now, of course, for the state, we might like them to pay it off. For taxpayers, we might like them to pay it off. Something else that isn't often spoken about, and it's actually maybe a good option for some of you. All of these financial systems since 2018 are available if you go to university part-time as well as full-time. You get a loan for the tuition fees, which are roughly around four and a half thousand pounds and you can get a living loan too, provided you're doing at least 25% of a course in a year. So it may be for some of you, for your own personal circumstances, decide going to university full-time isn't right for you. You may have family requirements that mean you can't do it. You might have to go and work in your family business. If those are the circumstances, actually going to university part-time isn't a bad thing to do. It takes you longer. You study for longer, it's longer until you graduate, it's longer until you move on, but it isn't a bad option. And the student financial options I've talked about today are all available and it all works in exactly the same way as it does going full time. The only possible difference is your total borrowing may be lower. And if your total borrowing is lower, then going back to my nice, it wasn't deliberate that we set you up like this, it's absolutely perfect for my, for my argument actually. Going back to my nice equation, that means more people would repay in full before the debt wipes. So, we have a slight, we'd have a bigger group here. The lower the borrowing, the more likely you are to repay in full before the debt wipes. So that's it from me. I, I mean, the summary, I hope you understand, is many of the messages that we hear about student finance are wrong. In practical terms, your tuition fees will be paid for you. You'll then have a living loan, which depends on how much your parents earn. All those will be wrapped up and you'll start to repay them in the April after you leave university. And you will repay based on what you earn, 9% of everything above £25,725. And you'll do that for 30 years, the vast majority of you, unless you clear what you borrow plus the interest that they added beforehand. Effectively, what we have is a financial no-win, no-fee system. So I hope university is going to cost you all a shed load of money because it means you're earning a shed load of money. Thank you very much. <laughs> so going to move on to questions now. Anybody have one? Yes. This might be slightly inappropriate. But if something were to happen to you, like if you were to like die or something, yeah. or like become disabled, would your would your student loan like go away? Or, like, would your parents have to pay it, it? It's not an inappropriate question at all. It's a really good one. If you have an illness that is going to lend your, end your life in a short time, or you die with your student loan, the student loan is not passed on. It is your student loan, and it would not be paid. Uh, you would not have to pay it, and nobody would have to pay the debt on your behalf and it's absolutely wiped on that basis. 
you know, but I just, just one thing, it's, it's not quite the same as that, it's worth saying about student finance as well. If you go to university and you study, and you drop out after a year, you still have the loans. Not graduating does not wipe your loans. So it is important to understand that once you go to university and you've had your living loan and you've had your tuition fee loan and after a year it's not right for you, you will still have some debt to repay. You'll still have some of the loan to repay. Any other questions? Go on, be brave. Yes, you're, I'm guessing you're a teacher. Um, I completely understand about um, taking student loans and maintenance loans because I do think it's potentially free money as a parent as well. Um, I have friends that have actually paid off all their children's maintenance. They didn't take a maintenance loan. They've paid, they've given them a living allowance. Do you think that's wise? Look, there are always issues about people's own individual finances and it depends how much money you've got. Um, the answer is, if you had a high earner, if you had a... a, a a child, in your case, you're asking as a, as a parent, if you had a child who was a high earner after they graduated, probably this sort of area of the room, because you're lowering the initial debt, because of the interest, there could be a marginal benefit. But again, I would absolutely prioritise as a parent, sorting your own finances so you're debt free first. I would never borrow to find this money to fund it and giving them a deposit for a first house, which is the most arduous thing most young people will find. Now we have to effectively, we want them to have a 10% deposit and property prices are so high. If you have done all of those things and your child is likely to be a high earner and you've got the cash and you don't have another call on it, there's nothing wrong with it. But I certainly wouldn't want the message to go to most parents who will never be in the position to do that, that the fact that you're not doing it means you are subserving your children, because you're not. And it's actually that the game well, there might be a loss. I mean, ultimately, if your child goes, let's take the positive example, let's take the, they go to be a great artist who's not successful in their lifetime. I mean, it's a bit silly, but it gives you a nice example of someone who does well, who, who's successful but doesn't earn a lot, then have thrown all the money away. But there are some people who might say, I want to contribute to the state, and they might have it do it for that reason. But so I think it, it's certainly not without its risks doing that. And I would probably... In any case, if you're making the decision as a parent to pay it off, I would put the money in the highest interest savings account I can, so currently 2% fix, while they're at university, accept that they're going to be playing inflation plus 3%, about 5%, so there's a 3% a year cost to doing it. And then once they leave university and they get a job, so you now have a better idea of their next 30 years, because you don't while they're at university, now got a better idea of what their earnings potential and path is going to be, then you may want to pay it off, and there's no prohibit, you can pay it off at any time without penalties. I probably wouldn't do it before they go to university. If you were looking at this purely from a, what is financially expedient for me, rather than wider morality about the state and how we factor all that into it, question. Any more questions? Yes. How do you know when to apply for like bursaries in your student loan? Well, bursaries are an interesting one. You're going to go through that path. And have you been to open days? Yeah, so you've all been to your open days. You started to see some universities you like. You make a decision on it. Big thing I need to mention that I should have mentioned earlier, so it's good it's just flicked into my head. Look, forget the tuition fee price. They will tend to all be £9,250 now. Originally, the plan was that the marketization of universities would mean there'd be different prices and you could use your course based on the price. It doesn't happen. Most of them are 9,250. But do look at the cost of living at the universities you're looking at. We talked about the maintenance loan before. There are, you can go online, and there's on Money Saving Expert, we have it, where you can get a rough idea of what your maintenance loan will be and then talk to your parents about what they'll give you. Then go and look at the cost of living. Look at the cost of halls, and there are books and indices out there at the cost of living in universities. That, unfortunately, while I don't like it, because I think we should have a meritocracy and you should be able to choose whatever university you go for just on how well, how well it's right for you and you're right for them, is a factor. So look at the cost of living at university when you're making those decisions of which universities to apply for. Bursaries may be available. They tend to be pretty rare these days. And actually, and fee reductions aren't actually, I'd always take cash over a fee reduction. You're going to be applying for your student finance by next May you're going to have made your university applications before you do that. There's a nice process to go through. That's actually quite easy and structural. The real thing to decide now is, do I want to? If I want to, which one do I want to go to? If I decide which I want to go to, can I afford to live while I am there? 
and those are the questions that you should be looking at right now. You should be having all this discussion with your parents, um, assuming that you're financially linked to them, which I, I would guess most of you are. And these are the ways that we make a choice. I would hope, I would always push, my first rule instinctively would be to say to you, if, you're go if going to university is right for you, it isn't always right. There are great apprenticeships out there. There are great jobs out there at 18. University is not the right path for everyone. Do a course that is properly going to benefit you both vocationally and, in, your, and in, in who you want to be as a person. But if going to university is right for you, then my first instinct would be go and choose the right course and try and work through the financial gap. If that course is right for you, go and choose that right course and go and do what you have to do. The system is not perfect. Other questions? Yes. For all the people who generate a personal income before going to uni, um, is their loan still de decided dependent on their family income? So, for it not to depend on your family income, you have to be what's called an independent student. And an independent student, now, if you're over 25 or have children, you're an independent student automatically. If you're not, then you have to be genuinely, properly, provably, financially separated and estranged from your parents to a real degree. So that is quite a difficult thing to prove that generally the state does not want you to prove. So, you know, you're talking all the hurdles in a 110 metre race worth of hurdles to jump through to get it. Just the fact that you're earning a little bit for yourself and providing for yourself a little bit does not make you an independent student. So it is quite a complex definition, and I would err on the side of imagining that you wouldn't be an independent student. You need to go and do your reading and see. If you think it's a plausible outcome, it, it, it's a big subject, but it's difficult to get certified as an independent student. So generally, family income would be... To be. The classic example, so I met a young man in, in something once who was 17, and his parents that there were issues with his parents and he had left home at 16 and he, he was living in foster care and he was f funding, for, funding himself to go through his education at the age of 17. He's an independent student. It's that sort, you see the, the sort of degree we're talking about separation. Yes? Can any of this change? Very glad you asked me that. Yes, is the answer. And this is the difficulty. Everything I'm telling you is based on the current system. Now, there are two types of possible changes. You are year 12, so you've got another year to go at school before, and you'll be making your applications over the next year, which is why this is the perfect time to do it. And then most of you, it's like you'll be starting university in a couple of years' time. Some of you may take years out, and it's another year after that. Now, there is talk at the moment of the system being changed, a, a report called the Auger Report, which proposed changes to the, the higher education system. I'm not going to go into those changes because it, it's quite a radical shift. It hasn't happened, it's not been accepted. But the perhaps more important element of that question is, once you sign up to this system, is what you sign up to locked in for those 30 years? And the answer to that is no, which makes this very difficult for me. Now, generally, negative retrospective changes, so that means something bad, a bad change that happens after you've signed up for it, go against all form of natural justice. So we would assume it wouldn't happen, and I did assume that wouldn't happen, and then having been, I, I headed a task force in 2011 when they changed the system, not because I supported the change, but because I supported explaining the change, called the Independent Task Force on Student Finance Information, and I chaired it uh, about how to communicate to young people what the changes in the system meant. And as part of that, I said that the threshold would be £21,000, as it was then, and then from 2017, it would rise with average earnings. And then in, in 2015, they announced that from 2017, it wasn't going to rise with average earnings, they would freeze it. And I was furious, because I felt like I'd been their information mule. I felt they'd use me as an independent task force. To, I had letters telling me this would happen, it was going to happen, and I was the person who said to all these people, it's going to be... It's going to start to increase from 2015, and I was furious. So I hired lawyers to take the government to court over it because I thought it was against natural justice, and we campaigned, and eventually they got rid of the freeze, and they, after campaigning, they put it up to £25,000, which is what we'd wanted, and they moved it with average earnings. But it was proof that bad things can happen and changes can happen. 
Now, there's things we think won't happen, like changing the 30-year wipe. That would be absolutely outrageous if they changed the 30-year wipe. But interestingly, the first thing to understand is a lot of this can be changed by what's called secondary legislation, which means it doesn't have to be voted on in Parliament. Voting on something in Parliament makes it more difficult to change anything. It can be done by the authority of a minister. So there is a political risk here that things could change. Even if, as someone like me campaigns, it should be locked into statute so you can change it by law, here's a word you don't hear often, Parliament is omnicompetent. Omni means all in Latin, competent is competent. So it's all competent. So technically, the UK Parliament could vote tomorrow that the United States of America was part of the United Kingdom. And then in law, the United States of America would be part of the United Kingdom under British law. I mean, it'd be nonsense, but Parliament could do what it likes. So you can never lock in anything, but at least if it were only changed by statute, changed by a vote through Parliament, it's more difficult to change things. But we don't have that. And one of the things that I lobby on is, well, if we're going to have terms that can be varied, we should say which are the terms that can be varied and which are the terms that aren't. Now, what I've done today and everything I've said to you today is based on the system as it exists right now. I think after the terrible shenanigans the government had, it is unlikely we will see retrospective changes, but it's far from impossible that the system will be changed once you've signed up for it. Could be the other way. We could have a hard left Labour government who decides to wipe all your debt. And, it, you know, in which case, again, overpaying would have been a mistake. So it's very difficult to make a decision. So all I can offer you, in frank honesty, is to explain to you how the system you're signing up to works if it stays as you've signed up to it. And I can't give you any more than that, but it's important that I say that to you. So all the decisions and the logic I've taught you about is based on the current system. And there could be some flaws in them if there were to be radical retrospective changes once you sign up. But I'm afraid, one of the things, well, I hope they do teach in schools now, and I talk about when I'm talking to all types of talks, one of the things we all have to learn to deal with in life, whether it's should I pay off my student loans or borrow up front, whether it's should I get my euros now for a holiday, should I lock the interest rate on my mortgage or lock the interest rate on my gas and electricity, whether it's should I marry him or her, is uncertainty. And we live in an uncertain world. And sometimes all you can do is embrace that and understand that. So I would make the decisions that you're making based on the system as it is now, because we cannot predict future changes. But I would be somewhat mindful to the fact that those changes could happen.